Good morning. Last time I did discuss the properties of electrocardiographic leads, ECG leads. And uh, even though in the beginning of the course I said that I do not discuss too much uh, clinical issues, I discuss the theory of bioelectromagnetism. Today I will speak about the basis of ECG diagnosis. The reason for this is that uh, I like the ECG diagnosis because uh, it is one of the very few issues in clinical diagnosis which is very logical. It is possible to, with reasoning, with the engineering uh, way of thinking, to see how the ECG signal is generated and how it changes due to various uh, uh, fundamental uh, disorders in the heart. But I will warn you, please do not think after this uh, lecture that you would be a competent uh, cardiologist. Clinical cardiology is very complicated science. Uh, seldom, very seldom there exists a single disorder in the heart. Usually it is a combination of various disorders and therefore uh, ECG diagnosis in clinical sense is quite complicated, except some very uh, fundamental cases. So let's go to the basis of ECG diagnosis. Uh, here I list uh, some constraints which help in uh, doing the inverse solution. Well, it's a long list. List I do not go throughout all the list, but uh, uh, in principle, because we know where the heart is located, it has two, uh, it has four chambers, uh, two atria, two ventricles, and so on. We know how the normal ECG is uh, uh, structured. Then that helps for uh, making the inverse solution from the recorded ECG signal. I do not go to the details here. I give you a list of various application areas in ECG diagnosis. Again, this is truth, the truth, but this is not the whole truth. This is just a very, very uh, simplified uh, list of, of various areas. Firstly, it is possible with ECG to find out what is the electric axis of the heart. What means electric axis? It means that where is a dominating, uh, dominating uh, uh, direction of the heart. Uh, it's not necessarily the strongest signal, but it is to find out in which direction the heart is oriented. Whether it is normal or horizontal. Horizontal means that it is uh, rotated uh, uh, counterclockwise and vertical that it is rotated clockwise. The most simple issue which can be diagnosed is the heart rate. And that is done for many uh, applications in, 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 in sports medicine is the, uh, and exercise is the, the uh, most wide application. Tachycardia means higher frequency heart rate, normal, and bradycardia, lower heart rate. Uh, arrhythmias. Uh, they are divided to supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. Supraventricular means that above the ventricles, above means hierarchical mainly, but when the patient is in standing position, it is also anatomically above the uh, ventricles. And then arrhythmias originating from ventricles. Activation sequence disorders like Atrioventricular conduction, WBW, that sounds funny, I tell you later on what is WBW, and right and left bundle branch blocks. Hypertrophy means uh, uh, abnormal growing of the atria or ventricles. Coronary circulation, 
uh, mildest stage is ischemia, lack of oxygen. Injury means that there is a, a, a problem in, in the cardiac uh, muscle and infarct, but it, is re it, it recovers, but uh, infarct means that the cardiac muscle is dead tissue due to lack of oxygen. Drug effect, various uh, uh, pharmaceutical agents, drugs like digitalis or kinidin, change the ECG signal. <coughs> Imbalance in electrolytes like potassium and calcium change the signal. Inflammation in myocardium or in pericardium, which are called carditis, uh, they change the signal. And finally, in the list, it can be monitored, the pacemaker operation. Now I go to the details. So, determination of the electric axis. It's rather simple to find from the ECG how the heart is oriented. Horizontal, normal or vertical orientation. Heart rate, the cardiac rhythm, as I said, is perhaps the most simple one, most simple issue. Uh, the normal situation is called normal sinus rhythm because the impulses originate from the uh, sinoatrial node with a normal rate, which is in rest something between 60 and 100 per minute. And starting from the sinus node, proceeding along atria, uh, going to the AV node along the binary branches to ventricles, as I have told you earlier. And that is how it looks like a normal sinus rhythm. Sinus bradycardia, the sequence is normal, but the sinus node gives impulses with a lower rate. So that's how it looks like. The rate is uh, less than 60 per minute. And tachycardia, sinus tachycardia, the sequence is normal, but the heart rate is faster. Sinus arrhythmia means that uh, the heart frequency is not constant. Uh, there's some uh, change in the heart rate and one reason for this is typically that there is uh, uh, abnormal connection of the information route in the vagus nerve and when the person is inhaling, <gasps> taking breath, then in inhaling uh, it is uh, activated the muscles of the uh, thoracic cage. And this activation also goes to the uh, control of sinus node, so that during inspiration the sinus node activation is increased. Expiration is uh, resting, it is not active. Expiration, exhaling is resting, uh, and theref therefore there is no uh, neuronal activity uh, uh, which could uh, activate the sinus node and during expiration the heart rate is lower. This is the typical reason for arrhythmia. Other reasons do exist as well. I go to next to the wandering pacemaker. It is one type of supraventricular arrhythmia. The reason is that uh, the activation does not initiate from the sinus node but it initiates from various parts of the atria. You see that the pacemaker, the, uh, the physiological pacemaker is wandering. It is moving to different locations in the atria and therefore the ECG signal, uh, firstly, it, uh, it has uh, irregular heart rate, but you see that if the activation starts close to the sinus node, the ECG signal is rather normal, but if it starts from close to the AV node, then you see that firstly the P wave is negative because atrial activity is going opposite direction and there is a shorter distance from the initiation of the atrial activity to the AV node, so this distance is very, uh, time distance is very short. If the activation starts from the left atrium, then there you may see a biphasic P wave in the ECG. 
I continue with the supraventricular arrhythmias, atrial flutter. The activation in the atria is continuous progress of the depolarization wave. It's going around the atria and the ventricles synchronize, for instance, to every third rotation of this atrial activation uh, flutter. Why such rotation does exist? It is usually connected to the hypertrophy, the enlargening of the atria. Therefore, that when the activation has proceeded along the atrial wall and returning back, it region has already uh, repolarized and is ready to depolarize again. Therefore, the activation may continuously uh, go around. Uh, is it dangerous? Well, uh, possibly the patient doesn't necessarily recognize it uh, immediately, so it may, may continue for a longer time. Uh, usually it will be discontinued by the cardiologists. Therefore, that the blood movement, blood circulation in the atria is abnormal due to this flutter and it may happen that some blood is remaining too long time in some, some corner or some, some remote location in the atria and it starts to clot and such uh, clots uh, when they are moving to the brain they, they of course uh, make problems in the uh, brain uh, blood circulation. So it is discontinued with a defibrillator shock. And of course, some medications are given at the same time, and so on and so on. Atrial fibrillation means that uh, this activation of atria is not regularly rotating or traveling around the atria, but it is going uh, in like a chaotic disorder in various directions. And atrial activity is seen as uh, fibrillation and uh, the ventricles uh, activate irregularly in a proper in the time which is proper for them. It's the same issue, atrial fibrillation will be discontinued with defibrillation. And junctional rhythm, uh, it means that uh, the, the, the uh, activation does not initiate from the sinus node, but it is initiated from the AV node. So the sinus node some, for some reason has uh, come too slow and uh, the, the region which is next uh, higher frequency in the heart which is AV node as I told you before starts to control the cardiac rhythm and the junctional rhythm is of course slower because the initial intrinsic frequency of AV node is much slower than that of the sinus node. And you see that because the activation proceeds in the atria, again in opposite direction, you don't see P wave before the QRS complex, but it is after the QRS complex and in negative orientation. <coughs> because it is moving in opposite direction and coming after the uh, ventricular activation. Very characteristic uh, ECG signal. I go now to the ventricular arrhythmias. Arrhythmias which are uh, produced in ventricles. Premature ventricular contraction is a typical. The activation initiates somewhere in the ventricular wall and proceeds along the ventricular wall. Uh, it looks like this. There is normal ECG uh, uh, PQRS complexes and then suddenly comes a wide uh, QRS complex. Wide, therefore, that the activation don't proceed fast along the bundle branches. It proceeds along the uh, ventricular wall. It comes wider and the ventricles are not able to depolarize at the correct time here uh, because they are uh, in repolarization state. 
So this normal QRS complex is missing, but the next one is coming at a time because the, the, the atria are activating <coughs> in constant frequency. So RR interval here, two times RR interval here, because this one is missing, and there's an extra wide ventricular contraction activation. Ventricular tachycardia means that this extra uh, pacemaker region is active continuously. Here in the previous case, it was only a sudden single activation. Here it is continuously activating and it activates the ventricles and it is ventricular tachycardia. Are these dangerous? Well, the premature ventricular contraction that happens uh, every then and now, usually elderly people have it, sometimes younger people not, not so often. It may be just felt that oops, it's extra, extra uh, beat in, in the heart, it, it's harmless. But ventricular tachycardia, it is uh, harmful or dangerous because the heart during the time is uh, stressed too much because it is continuous high activation and that is, that is not healthy. Then ventricular fibrillation. It is a case where the normal activation of ventricles does not take place, but the activation is proceeding along the ventricular wall. Always there, there is uh, um, repolarized uh, cells which are able to depolarize again, and the activation and, and the contraction of the ventricles is not uh, regular, but it is very irregular and activation is going around. And therefore, uh, the ECG signal looks like that. And therefore, the mechanical pumping effect of the ventricles disappears because the net volume of the ventricles is not changing regularly like in the normal pumping, but because the activation is going around irregularly in the ventricles, the net volume is constant and the pumping effect uh, disappears. And you can easily see in this very good demonstration which has been made with a the dog, there is first normal ECG signal and then along a catheter which is placed to the heart of the dog is fed electric current increased its amplitude. So at certain amount of car or level of current, the heart generates a premature ventricular contraction and with the higher uh, 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 stimulation current, it heart goes to the fibrillation state. You see that from the recorded atrial blood pressure that here it is normal Due to the premature ventricular contraction, it is decreasing and the normal QRS again brings it back. But then when fibrillation starts, blood pressure very fast decreases and goes down close to zero. This is the very, very dangerous situation. I return to this issue because uh, everyone understands that if the blood pressure suddenly collapses down, there is no blood circulation. That's more than dangerous. This ventricular fibrillation is discontinued with the defibrillator. I come to this in more detail, but the idea is that it is given a strong electric shock with these two electrodes, which electric shock depolarizes the whole heart completely. And then after that, hopefully, it starts to beat normally. Not necessarily immediately, perhaps after giving another shock, it uh, starts to beat normally. And the pacemaker gives uh, a characteristic signal, uh, which is shown here. What is a pacemaker and why a pacemaker is installed? I tell that in detail, but I already go uh, to this uh, cardiac mechanism very soon. It is here. 
atrioventricular blocks. It means that the activation does not normally proceed from the atria to the ventricles. These atrioventricular blocks are divided to three categories, first degree, second degree, and third degree. The first degree AV block means that the ECG signal looks rather normal, but the difference uh, is that the PR interval is longer than normal. So even though atria uh, contract normally, P wave is normal, there is an extra delay from atria to the AV node. And that extra delay is seen as a longer PR interval. Second degree block means that, again, activation starts normally from the sinus node, but there is a partial block in the uh, conduction system here, which means that uh, sometimes the activation don't proceed to the Q to ventricles, and after P is not seen a QRS complex, after the second P wave is seen normal QRX and T, after that P wave again not seen the ventricular activation. So, for instance, every second ventricular activation is missing. Again, it is not so regular, it may be for a while like this, then it returns to normal, then changes. So, Nothing is so regular in, in nature, but this is how it typically looks like. And finally, the third degree AV block means that uh, atrial activation is normal, but and the ventricular activation itself is quite normal, but there is no synchronization between atria and ventricles. You see that the P waves come here regularly and QRS complexes come regularly, but there is no synchronization between atrial and ventricular activation. So there is a full electric block between atria and ventricles. This means that uh, the P wave frequency is usually it is normal. It is between 60 and 100 because sinus node operates normally. But because the intrinsic frequency of the AV node is much lower, then the QRS complexes come with a lower rate, which is something between 20 and 55. Well, is it good or bad? Of course it is bad. Bad means that the, that the pumping frequency has decreased much lower than normal and uh, uh, it means that the blood pressure decreases lower. The patient usually loses the consciousness, falls down, but does not die because uh, there is sufficient blood circulation to, to uh, maintain the blood circulation in the brain so that the brains uh, uh, brains are not damaged, but the consciousness of the patient disappears for that time. How that is uh, uh, cured? It is cured with a pacemaker. Pacemaker is a device, electronic device, which gives, uh, where is a catheter electrode going to the right ventricle, and it gives constant electric pulses uh, stimulating the ventricles. The pacemaker is not usually installed here, it is installed uh, in the region of abdomen. I will speak about pacemaker later on. I will tell that pacemakers were first very simple primitive uh, pulse generators just gave continuously electric impulses once per second. 60 per minute, no other control. The next version was that uh, they sense the cardiac activation and if the ventricles are operating normally, they are silent. It is silent, but if the ventricles uh, 
frequency has decreased too low, then it starts to give the impulses. It is called the demand pacemaker. Thereafter, you may guess that uh, when, when the smartphones, telephones include today very sophisticated uh, and, and powerful computers and, and comp powerful programming, complicated programming, then you may guess that a pacemaker today also has a very powerful computer inside and a lot of intelligence to find the, the, the best uh, way to give the impulses to the heart. So today the pacemakers are very complicated electronic devices. Uh, bundle branch blocks. Right and left bundle branch blocks uh, change the activation in the ventricles. I do not go too much to the details. I just show here that uh, if the activation starts from the atria and then right bundle branch is cut, then the activation proceeds from the left heart uh, along the walls, not to along the bundle branch, uh, and then the whole ventricles are activated. The uh, ventricular QRS uh, loop looks like this, and if you take the projections to the, to the precordial leads, you get the signals. Don't go to the details. Please understand that this is the mechanism. And the same. In the left bundle branch block, activation proceeds uh, along the right bundle and then along the ventricular wall like that. And the loop looks like that. And you may just consider how the ECG signal looks like. Now I come to this WPW, WPW syndrome, which is uh, the full name is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. It is a situation where the activation from atria are able to go directly through the atria, the, the wall between atria and ventricles, which is abnormal. Normally, activation proceeds only to the uh, AV node and there forward. It may come here directly, which means that there is some initially uh, abnormally early ventricular activation due to this uh, progress and here is P wave and there is abnormal early ventricular activation which is called delta wave because that looks like a delta like this. So QRS complex starts abnormally too early. Then that's a long story about hypertrophies but I try to make it shorter. What means hypertrophy? Hypertrophy means that uh, either uh, atria or ventricles, one atria or one ventricle abnormally grows. It grows either wall thickness or the volume of the chamber. That may be diagnosed with ECG. The reason why it is diagnosed is that it uh, it is, uh, you try to find what is the reason for this abnormal growth of the, uh, of the atrium or ventricle. And the reason is, uh, uh, for instance, it is uh, 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 stenosis in the, in the valve. The valve is opening is smaller. It needs harder pressure from the previous chamber uh, to pump the blood. Or the valve is leaking so that the part of the blood is leaking back and more blood needs to be pumped. Or the blood pressure has increased systemi systemic circulation or in pulmonic circulation and con uh, consequently the, 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 uh, the, the atrium or ventricle is, uh, has to make more work and it will be grown. That is the reason. So how it is diagnosed, uh, right atrial hypertrophy means that the, uh, this region of the uh, P uh, wave is stronger uh, than normal. Left atrial hypertrophy means that that region or part of the atrial activation is larger. 
which means that the B wave is uh, biphasic. It is called mitral B wave. And uh, right ventricular hypertrophy means that uh, the activation is stronger to the direction orientation of the right ventricle and left ventricular hypertrophy similarly that the orientation of the ventricular activation is oriented more to the left ventricle. Some words about the coronary circulation. In the cardiac muscle, of course, there are uh, arteries and veins in themselves to maintain the very important muscle. This is a beautiful figure of the coronary arteries and veins. It is from the dog heart, where the heart muscle is filled by a certain kind of plastic uh, from the arteries and then the plastic has hardened and then with some uh, uh, some way it is diluted the muscle off so this is how it looks like the coronary arteries and veins in dog heart and very similar in human heart as well in elderly people these uh, coronary arteries will uh, gather uh, inside the wall some plaque uh, which uh, makes the, the 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 loom and the opening of the of the artery thinner and uh, makes uh, difficulties for the blood circulation and causes uh, uh, angina pectoris some some chest pain in the because the heart heart doesn't get sufficient amount of blood uh, this is diagnosed with the exercise ecg test uh, in resting state it is usually sufficient amount of oxygen and the patient ECG is normal and patient doesn't feel anything uh, bad. But when the patient is exercised, the heart is uh, working with a faster frequency. It needs more blood and then the blood is not sufficient because the, the coronary artery, artery is uh, thinner, smaller, and that changes the ECG. It is seen uh, firstly the patient feels very uncomfortable and feels uh, uh, pain in the chest what it how it is seen in ecg is that the st segment here is decreasing it is seen here i return to this again a bit later okay i, I think i returned it just now uh, in the dc uh, magnetocardiogram it can be seen the ST segment is here, and due to the uh, ischemic heart disease, the ST segment is decreasing, the ST deviation. Uh, then myocardial ischemia and infarction, when the blood circulation is so much blocked that the, that the certain region doesn't get blood enough or at all, starts first ischemia, then injury, and then finally infarct the the, the blood the cardiac muscle will die and as you remember i did teach you in in the solid angle theorem that that is seen in the ecg as if here were an active uh, vector inwards which is uh, a paradox this is complicated i do not go to the details but from ecg it is possible to find uh, the, not only that there is an infarct but also to find its location. That is too complicated. I do not go to that details. And then this is the final curve. Can you think what curve this is? I did teach you a lot. Well, this was shown in the, in the meeting of the Finnish Cardiac Society. And that is the everywhere interest rate for three months in 1999. But it looks very interesting. I may tell you that all the cardiologists were making a lot of suggestions of the cardiac uh, disorders, but it was a everywhere, everywhere change. I go next to magnetocardiography. So you remember these equations for ECG and MCG, the electric field equation and magnetic field equation due to the electric activation of the heart. And you remember that the first magnetocardiogram was recorded by Boyle and McPhee in 1963. 
And you remember, as I told you, that the published magnetocardiogram was erroneous. This is the time derivative of the magnetocardiogram. And that's a charming lady who was uh, uh, used as a uh, first experimental subject in, not necessarily the first one, but as an experimental subject for, for uh, uh, magnetocardiography. That shows the, the coils. Well, I can tell you as a, as a, as a hist history that uh, uh, Gerhard Boyle told sometimes that uh, the first magnetocardiogram, which they were recording by Richard McPhee in Syracuse, New York, uh, in the United States, they made it on the beach, uh, far away from the power lines, so that they would not disturb the signal. And to stabilize the patient, he was just into the, uh, under the sand on the beach, so that only his uh, head was above, so that it was very stable and not moving. And it was a hot day, and he was sweating a little bit, actually quite much, and there were a lot of flies in the beach who, which were came to eat the, the, the sweat from the face of the Gerhard Boyle. But anyhow, that was how the first magnetocardiogram was measured. I tell you how it was measured in Finland for the first time. It was made in winter time on, on the, uh, on the uh, ice of the bay, Huopalahti Bay, close to the Helsinki University of Technology, far away from the power lines. And uh, to get uh, the detector as close as possible to the, to the patient, the patient had to take clothes away from the, from the chest so that there was a lot of lot of frost, several degrees, uh, minus degrees centigrade of frost, and uh, he was without the shirt in, in, in th for this experiment. So completely opposite kind of situations. But for science, one can do whatever is needed. I think I will skip this. That is not necessary. Uh, this is the way how we did uh, record magnetocardiography at those times. I entered the field of biomagnetism in 1972. We did not understand too much what is going on in, in biomagnetism. And in 1973, I published in the Congress uh, this kind of standard grid uh, indicating how we wanted to make the recordings. It was uh, uh, six by six uh, grid fixed to the skeleton of the thorax, and recordings were made in the s just above the center of each of these, these squares, and these are the signals. So it was called standard grid, but it took some time before I understood that this is not the way to do the, the magnetocardiogram. Here are the first magnetocardiography recordings, in very first, some of the very first in, made in Finland. The grid has the system has a uh, fundamental problem, which is that uh, if the magnetocardiogram is recorded laterally here on the side, not above the heart, the lead field goes like that uh, above the heart, and you may recognize that it is quite the same similar lead field as that of ECG lead two. So why to record ECG lead two so complicated way? So the grid system is not the way to proceed. I show here a nice experiment which was made by David Cohan in, in MIT, where he did demonstrate with a dog experiment uh, that uh, how, how the ECG leads are, are uh, linear and MCG leads are uh, tangential. I, I go through this experiment because I, I like this work. Uh, it was first uh, recorded the ECG and the MCG of the dog from different locations. Here is the chest and the heart is locating here. You see that the ECG uh, lead one is quite small in this uh, dog. Two and three are large signals. In magnetocardiogram, just above the heart, the signal is not very high, but laterally it is much higher. And that is therefore that uh, the lead field increases intensity as a radial distance from the symmetry axis. So just above the heart, it is not so large, therefore. Then he made so that he opened the chest of the dog, covered 
the ventricles with the latex foil, which is electrically insulating, and repeated the recordings. Uh, then the ECG leads two and three did not show ventricular activation because I can show it later on. Uh, the ECG lead field does not go through the ventricles because it is electrically insulated. About the magnetocardiogram, the lateral magnetocardiogram is suppressed just above the heart, not any changes, and again the lateral magnetocardiograms are suppressed. I show you in detail why it is so. And when taking the, the latex foil off, the signals are quite the same as before. This is the story. ECG lead 2 gives strong signal because lead field is going uh, just through the ventricles. When the heart is covered, then the lead fields are uh, going around the ventricles, not through the ventricles, and ventricular activation QRS is suppressed in the ECG signal. P activation is uh, uh, normally detected. In magnetocardiogram, when it is coaxial, this latex foil does not make any effect because the lead field is tangential, ventricular activation and atrial activation normally seen. But when making recording laterally further away, then the magnetocardiographic lead field does not go through the latex foil and QRS complex is not recorded. P is recorded normally. So this is very logical. How to detect the magnetocardiogram? This is, I initially told you already before, how to measure the magnetic dipole. It needs three orthogonal lead fields. And uh, this you remember that this is the basic uh, one single component of, of the lead field. We have the magnetic dipole. It has three components, X, Y, and Z. And unipolarly, they may be measured with these three coils. And as I told you, better signal quality is obtained with bipolar measurements, having two coils on both sides of the source. I don't go through this. Uh, this I just mentioned that this is the first magnetocardiographic lead system suggested by McPhee. Theoretically okay, but practically certainly would not work because it collects a lot of noise. So let's skip this. Logical way to make the three orthogonal recordings is just as I did show in the previous slide. Have two magnetometers on opposite sides of the heart and just taking the average of the signals. So this X component is easy to record, Y component is possible to record, but Z component due to the anatomy of the body is difficult. It, you cannot really place it on the Z axis and, and that's, a, that's a problem. It is possible to rotate the orthogonal coordinate system to so-called ABC coordinates and make the recordings which are, uh, which are symmetrically made. And with this matrix, multiply the ABC signals to get the XYZ signals. It's, there is still more simple way to record the magnetocardiogram. Just think this magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic dipole, X component, it generates in that location a magnetic field. If we have the Y component here and just look how the magnetic field is, uh, is, is uh, proceeding in the space. There is one magnetic field flow line going through that location and it is seen in the opposite direction as the, the source. And same for the Z component. So you see that if we record at that location three orthogonal components of the magnetic field, that is related to the three orthogonal components of the magnetic dipole. So that makes the measurement much more simple. The equations of the magnetic field due to the magnetic uh, uh, dipole are given here. And you can find from these equations that the R component is two times larger than the, th the theta component, 
which means that when the recordings are made here about the heart, the y and z components must be multiplied with a factor of 2 and taken the opposite polarity to get three orthogonal components of the magnetic dipole of the heart with a normalized way. This is so-called unipositional lead system. The magnetometer is uh, placed just uh, in the opening of the fourth intercostal space. It's a location of the ECG lead V2. Measuring the unipositional lead system symmetrically on both sides of the heart makes much better lead field. I can show you that the only non-symmetric on the only anterior side is not so good because it records only the anterior part of the heart. So this is a non-symmetric measurement about the heart and this is a symmetric measurement where the distance from the center of the heart is equal to both of these recording, recording systems. There are three orthogonal coils in this tumor. And the magnetometer is discended just above the patient, and that's how it is recorded. How does the measurement sensitivity in magnetocardiogram uh, distribute? If you think that here is the heart and there is a coil, so this is a symmetry axis. The orientation of the lead field is uh, always tangential. And I show here, this is a radial distance from the symmetry axis. I indicate here the magnitude of, of the lead field. You find that closer to the heart, it is of course increasing as a function of radial distance. Closer to the heart, it is much higher than in the posterior part of the heart. It is seen in this figure more clearly. Here this is a body, the thorax. The spherical heart model is just located here. Magnetometer is here. We see the x-axis. You find that the highest sensitivity is in this region. This is the half sensitivity volume. Hardly any recordings or, or signal amplitude is recorded on the posterior side of the heart. That is the deficiency, the bad situation in the non-symmetric recording with the unipositional lead system. Uh, if we do the measurement symmetrically, have the uh, coil on both sides, then we have to take the anterior side further away, though we place the record, uh, detector on the posterior side as close as possible. So if it is here, the detector, just uh, only the posterior lead, its uh, uh, half sensitivity volume is much larger and we may just rotate it upside down to see how the coil in frontal side looks like the lead field. It looks like this. And then if we place the average of the two uh, recordings on both sides in the symmetric way, you find that it is very ideal, actually very beautiful uh, lead field. The half sensitivity volume is just so large regions. That is a very high quality lead field. And for the Y and Z leads, for the Y lead, a symmetric measurement gives that kind of lead field, which is very good. And for the Z equally, which is very good. How the magnetocardiogram signal is generated from the activation of the heart. If you think th this X lead then first activation starts on the septum in this direction, which means negative signal in X lead. Then later on activation front is here and it gives uh, returns to a bit positive signal. And finally here it gives more positive signal. So this is the way how you can uh, do reasoning how the signal comes from the activation of the heart to the magnetocardiography. How the magnetocardiogram looks like. This is the electrocardiogram recorded from, from the subject. It is actually the Frank vector cardiogram, X, Y, and Z leads, and the magnitude. And you see that the loop here is front, the sagittal frontal and transverse plane. You see that the loop is oriented. I can just take this. Oh, that's it. 
a bit too long, but I show. So the ECG loop is oriented left and down and back. That is the main orientation of the electrocardiographic uh, ECG vector. Magnetocardiogram looks very similar. It has P, Q, R, S and T waves in X, Y and Z components. And but the main difference is that it is oriented uh, left, uh, left, back and up. So ECG was oriented that way and MCG is oriented that way. So there is about 90 degrees angle between the electric and magnetic heart vectors. And uh, this is shown here. This is the angle between electric and magnetic heart vectors during the normalized QRS duration. And in the maximum of the QRS duration, it is 90 degrees. First, it is angle is larger and then it is smaller. It is, of course, not the same in every uh, patients, if it would be always the same, then I could say that please give me the patient's ECG. I can calculate his MCG just rotating at 90 degrees, but it's not so simple. The magnitude, here is a vector magnetocardiogram. Uh, uh, the magnitude, uh, here is vector electrocardiogram magnitude. And let's compare this. It is different to compare magnetic and electric field magnitudes, but I just scale them the top uh, magnitude is the same. You find that the electrocardiogram is a bit larger in the beginning and magnetocardiogram a bit larger in, uh, in the end, which fits to the theory that uh, the sensitivity of magnetocardiogram is lower in the center of the heart and larger in the uh, uh, epicardial region. And the magnetocardiogram is sensitive to tangential activation and in the latter part of the QRS complex activation is tangential. It fits to the theory, but it needs some positive imagination to find the uh, fitting. Then some examples of the clinical application. We made the first clinical study to compare electric, uh, the diagnostic performance of electrocardiography and magnetocardiography. Uh, we made it a bit earlier, but we published that in 2000 and 2002. In Tampere, we have recorded almost 1,000 patients, the magnetocardiogram. But in this study, we selected patients who had the following uh, cardiac disorders, old inferior myocardial infarction, 90 patients, old anteroceptal myocardial infarct, 71 patients, and normal healthy patient, persons, 152. Altogether, 313 patients. And the clinical status, please note that the clinical status of the patients was confirmed with non-electromagnetic methods. This is, of course, important when we try to compare the electric and electro and magnetocardiogram properties. So that you remember that we had 313 patients in this study. I saw the picture of the car of Donald Duck. You know that his register plate is 330. We made the classification of these patients. So we, with electrocardiography and magnetocardiography, we tried to classificate the patients who has uh, uh, inferior myocardial infarction and who is healthy. The correct classification, well, this is a quite uh, uh, artificial situation. When the patient comes to the hospital, it is not so simple that does he has uh, IMI or not. But this is uh, the study was we made. We found that with electrocardiography, we could make the classification correctly in 90, about 90% 90 of the cases. And magnetocardiography quite the same amount, a, a bit larger, but pla practically the same amount. And when combining electro and magnetocardiography in the computerized system, we could classify correctly 95% of the cases. Is that increase from 90 to 95, is that important? It is statistically significant. And if we find out 
what is the rate of incorrect classification. You recognize that the incorrect classification decreased from about 10 to about 5%, which means that the incorrectly diagnosed patient's number decreased to one half. We made further studies. This, this I feel, is, uh, is quite uh, clarifying. We studied how well a single electrocardiographic lead could classify these patient groups. The worst of these three leads was axe lead. 72.3% of the patients were corrected, uh, classified correctly. With only Y lead, 77 and so, and with only Z lead, 87% were co classified correctly. Then we took two ECG leads. X and Y combination was the first, 81. X, Z, the second, 87. And Y and Z leads gave 89. And finally, taking all the three leads, X, Y, and Z, to the computerized system, the classification gave 90% correct classification. And this is the vector cardiography. We made the same test with magnetic leads. Only one lead, the Z lead, was the worst, X a bit better, and Y the best. And then combination of two leads. And finally, taking all the three magnetocardiographic leads, we got 91.7% classification. These are the numbers which I did show in the previous graph. This is the vector magnetocardiogram. Then we took all possibilities, electric and magnetic. Uh, here are one electric and one magnetic. Here are uh, two electric and one magnetic, one electric and two magnetic, and so on and so on. Finally, having all the three, six leads, X, Y, Z, electric, X, Y, Z, magnetic, gave the 95.5%, which I did show you. This presented in uh, 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 graphical form shows the story. What you find here? It shows that the more, the more you take these dipolar electric or magnetic leads to the diagnostic system, the better, better, better and better classification you get, independently whether they are electric or magnetic leads. So they all dipolar leads are about the same value. Of course, it does not go just accurately, but in principle like that. And that is the interesting point. So it shows that the electric and magnetic leads are quite equal. This is normals and inferior myocardial infarction. We made the same with normals and anterior myocardial infarction. And again, the situation was the same. And what is characteristic is that uh, in IMI and AMI cases, the behavior was the same, but of course, the order of the leads the, uh, in, in preference were not the same because different leads detect in different way different regions of the heart. So this is how I tell that what, how we gain with magnetocardiography. These are all the patients with this pink circle. Just get this working like this. With electrocardiography, I just uh, demonstrate we can diagnose correctly so many patients. With magnetocardiography, we can diagnose correctly quite the same amount of patients, but these patient groups are not the same. This is the trick. They are different patient groups. So therefore, when combining electro and magnetocardiography, we get larger amount of correctly diagnosed patients. This is the trick. There's nothing new under the sun. The same phenomenon is already inside electrocardiography. I demonstrate that uh, uh, I don't have data here. I just speculate and I'm, I'm sure that this is, this is in principle okay. With single electrocardiographic lead diagnosed correctly those patients, with Y lead this, these patients and Z lead those patients, and having all three leads diagnosed correctly those patients. Same holds with within magnetocardiography and holds when combining electric and magnetic leads to electromagnetocardiography. So what I want to demonstrate here is that in principle, when taking 
all the possible cardiac diseases. I claim, and I have a good reason to claim, that electrocardiography and magnetocardiography in average are equally good. And when we take, uh, and also their uh, component leads, X, Y, and Z, are similarly equally good. The more of these dipolar leads we take to the computerized system, the better, better, and better diagnostic performance we obtain. So the, what I demonstrate is that the electrical, electro and magnetocardiography in principle, in average, are equally good, but it gives a possibility to have three more dipolar leads when we apply magnetocardiography in combination of electrocardiography. That is the story. Then I show you some special applications of magnetocardiography. Those were just average, but some special applications. You remember this, which I did show in connection of magneto and encephalography. If we have a spherical model for the volume conductor, a high resistivity region here, which was the skull in uh, encephalography, does not affect the magnetic lead field because it is tangential. We may apply this special property in magnetocardiography. And the application is fetal magnetocardiography, recording the magnetocardiogram of the fetus. There's a beating heart, and the magnetocardiography is recorded. I show you why. Uh, this picture I like very much. We took that uh, in our magnetically shielded room in Tampere. The happy mother is the secretary of the neighboring institute. Look how kindly she is smiling and how happy she is having, having her baby in the stomach. I like this picture so much, so much. We are recording the magnetocardiogram from her baby. Here is one picture of Leonardo Vinci from 1510 showing the fetus. I just show you a beautiful anatomy picture from 1773. This is like a piece of, piece of ext extra beautiful art of the mother with the fetus. Uh, in my understanding, the painter had taken the orientation of the fetus from the Leonardo da Vinci picture because in my understanding, the fetus is in abnormal position. This would, should be the normal position. So let's have a look. The heart is beating and we want to record the fetal electrocardiogram. We think that if these are the ECG leads, the, uh, the electrodes, the lead is proceeding like this. And we record the fetal electrocardiogram. But that is not the case. There is, under the skin of fetus, especially in the later phase of the pregnancy, a vernix caseosa, which is a white, cheesy, waxy substance that coats the skin of a fetus in late pregnancy. It is a very good electric insulator. The fetus body and maternal abdomen has a, conductivity, a resistivity of 5 ohmmeters, but Vernix caseosa has 0.5 mega ohmmeters. So it is an excellent electric insulator. Therefore, actually, when recording fetal electrocardiogram, the lead field is not able to go through the, the Vernix caseosa. It goes around, actually more around than what I have drawn here, but goes in, anyhow, goes around. And therefore, recording the fetal electrocardiogram is not so easy. But if we take the magnetocardiogram, let's place the magnetocardiogram recorder here. The lead field is tangential and the Vernix caseosa does not disturb the lead field. So it is possible to record the fetal magnetocardiogram. This is a nice application which comes from the fact that the lead field is tangential. Here is a device uh, instrument for making this kind of recording. This is uh, in the United States, this instrument, and uh, this is in, in Germany in the MEG center. So it is recording the fetal magnetocardiogram from the fetus. By the way, this is a very excellent instrument. Uh, maybe I did show it to you before. Very sensitive, which also records 
uh, possible to record the fetal magnetoencephalogram. Well, here the fetus is a small baby just outside, but here it is recorded from the fetus. And here are the signals. Uh, there's a raw signal, and then it is extracted. The mother's QRS complex and the evoked potentials here shown. I don't go too much to the details. Excellent engineering in the instrument, not for every hospital. I did mention in the connection of electrocardiography diagnosis the ischemic heart disease. I did just show this picture when um, I repeat the blood circulation is sufficient in resting state even though there is narrowed coronary artery. But during exercise the blood circulation is uh, more oxygen is needed and it is not sufficient to supply the, the uh, ventricular muscle and therefore it is seen a depression of the ST segment in the signal. Uh, here it is made the exercise, as I mentioned, the uh, treadmill is used in the United States and, and the bicycle is used in Europe. Here you can also recognize that this is a mason Likar uh, lead system, the electrodes are here. The gentleman is biking and I think he is in better condition, he doesn't really have ischemic heart disease, he's a uh, good mannequin, but if the patient has a heart, uh, ischemic heart disease, then the ST segment during the, or due to the exercise is decreasing. This is how the ischemic heart disease is uh, diagnosed. But actually here is a trick. Let's have a look to the very nice experiment which was again made by David Cohen and Kaufman in MIT. They had a dog experiment. They moved a dog in the magnetically shielded room to the magnetic field detector and back and recorded the magnetocardiogram. Then they artificially closed the coronary arteries for two minutes so that uh, the coronary circulation was uh, decreased, took the dog to the detector and back, then took the occlusion away, a normal state, and again close and back. How did the magnetocardiogram look like? Here is the first case. Dog is taken under the, uh, or close to the detector. It is seen, a normal dog magnetocardiogram. Then during the occlusion, what is seen? You find that the ST segment depression is not a ST segment depression. It is a raise of the baseline. The ST segment is just on the baseline and then back. So there is a so-called injury current flowing in the heart which raises the baseline between the QRS complexes. And in electrocardiography, because it is not going to the DC frequency, it is AC, you think that it is depression of the, uh, of, of the ST segment because uh, the baseline uh, baseline uh, uh, is not seen, it is AC measurement. But in magnetocardiography, because the detector is superconducting detector, it is possible to go to down to zero frequency, you see that the ST segment depression is not an ST segment depression, it is a baseline uh, in, uh, raising. Why this is not made in electrocardiography? Well, th in theory it is possible to make some, I think some experiments have made but not so successful because the contact potential of the electrodes is making problem here. That is the reason why ECG is not, it is not stable. That's the reason why the ECG is not taken in uh, DC. Very nice experiment. Uh, about the improved diagnostic performance. So, further studies should be made to find the areas where the MCG and also MEG bring important new information. More money is needed, as the scientists usually say. So with ECG, as I said, can be diagnosed. Such amount of patients with MCG correctly, so many. And this is the interesting region. Who are these patients who are recorded, de detected correctly by MCG, but not by ECG? So this is the improvement what is obtained with magnetocardiography. Uh, these very special patients, we, we were stupid enough to try to find out who are these patients. We made a lot of work to find if there's some factor which 
characterizes this patient, but we didn't find. And we were stupid, therefore, that if we had found some characteristic factor, we would not need magnetocardiography anymore. We would need ECG and that factor. That would be enough. Uh, some summary about the biomagnetic instrumentation in magnetocardiogram. Magnetocardiography signal is rather strong. It is rather strong signal, which means that shielded room perhaps is not necessary. Usually better signal is obtained in the shielded room, but it is possible to record magnetocardiogram also outside shielded room. That is not possible with magnetoencephalogram. There has been made some uh, technical uh, developments uh, to make uh, uh, detectors which are not cooled down with liquid helium, but with liquid nitrogen, nitrogen which is uh, uh, much technically much easier than using liquid helium. It is higher, higher temperature. The high TC squids have been developed. S noise level is not as good with low DC, low TC squids, but it is f sufficient for magnetocardiogram. So the price for magnetocardiography is reasonable. So therefore, I believe that it should be made a lot of further studies with magnetocardiography. There are some groups and some companies which are active in, in this field, but activation is not as much as I would like to see. Well, here I uh, ask this question, perhaps this could be asked uh, uh, at the end of the biomagnetism in general. When was really made the first biomagnetic measurement? So, 1838, Carlo Matteucci recorded the first bioelectric signal uh, the, from the frog muscle. He fed this current to the coil, which induced a magnetic field, which did turn the detector. So is this detection of bioelectric or, bio or magnetic signal? Is this uh, bioelectricity or biomagnetism? When Boyle and McPhee, McPhee recorded the electric activity of the heart with a magnetic detector, the magnetic field induced uh, here an electric current in the lead which was wound around the, the, the magnodes. So what is the difference here? Well. Technically, there is not too much difference, but the trick is that it is the flux source which is detected by bioelectricity, and it is the vortex source which is detected by biomagnetism. So this is the fundamental difference. I have some 15 minutes time. I will proceed. Uh, I could show some historical slides, but uh, maybe I skip those today. I go to functional electric stimulation in uh, part six of the book, electric and magnetic stimulation of neural tissue. Functional electrical stimulation. These are uh, classical pictures made by uh, Duchenne, Guillaume Benjamin Amand Duchenne, uh, 1806 to 1875 did he live. So what is he doing? He has with these two electrodes, he makes electric stimulation, stimulation with electric current of the subject. So the subject does not change the, uh, 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 or the muscles, uh, activate the muscles of his face. He's just uh, relaxed, but the stimulation makes the muscles to, to activate. So this smile is artificial smile. Here's this artificial raising of eyebrow. Here's artificial lowering of jaw. And artificial smile again. A very angry person artificially <laughs> and happy just by stimulation. So this is functional electric stimulation, just an experiment. This is another a uh, famous experiment made by uh, uh, Dr. Jose Delgado. He installed an electric stimulation to the brain of the bull, and it had a radio receiver, and he was himself uh, working as a toreador, and he had a radio uh, transmitter in his hand. 
the bull is attacking, and then he presses the button, and the bull stops. Because there's this electric stimulation to the brain of, of the bull, and it bull changes his behavior just because of this electric stimulation. Just experiments. We made in Tampere uh, an important work which, uh, from which was uh, uh, finally come, came a, a, a company, uh, Atrotec. This is, uh, there was a patient in Tampere, a gentleman who had some accident, he got, had hit uh, his head and there was paralyzed partially the motoric uh, system so that when he was walking, he was not able to raise the, the foot as we do normally in walking, and therefore the walking was difficult. He was just uh, uh, drawing, drawing his uh, leg uh, back, uh, just uh, uh, relaxed and paralyzed. So we installed uh, a stimulation to the motoric nerve, which raises the foot. Here is shown the installation. And then there is a receiver uh, which receives signal from, from the transmitter outside the skin. The receiver is installed under the skin. And here is, uh, is the system. Under the heel of the foot is a switch. And when the patient uh, uh, is walking so that his uh, uh, heel is touching the floor, the switch contacts and sends a signal uh, to the electronic transmitter here and it is received by the receiver in, in under the skin which stimulates the motoric nerve so here it is relaxed and raises the foot uh, with the stimulation which makes the walking possible here is another stimulator made with the with the same group uh, there are tetraplegic patients or paraplegic patients. There are two names. It means that uh, if the patient person in a strong accident uh, uh, may get uh, the, the motoric uh, nerves uh, going from the brain to the body, or, or the path is cut on the neck. That happens often when, when, the, when the young young boys are diving uh, um, to the to the lake and don't understand that the lake is very shallow and they hit their head to the, to the bottom of the lake and they, they get just, uh, neck is, uh, is bent and, and they get the accident. Car accidents are a typical reason for tetraplegic patients. It means there are several levels of this, these friend, tetraplegic patient uh, paralysis, but normally the person, uh, person has the, the, the brain is operating normally, uh, person is thinking normally and, and looking with the eyes and listening and, and so on, but the body is paralyzed and the patient is not able to move arms and legs. That is the tetraplegy means uh, for, uh, uh, for arm uh, paralysis. And what is important, more important is that the patient is not able to breathe because uh, the, the phrenicus nerve is paralyzed, the phrenicus nerve which is, uh, which is taking the breathing with, with the diaphragm. So to these patients, it is placed uh, an electrode under the skin, stimulating the phrenicus nerve, and here is under the skin is a receiver, and with the external transmitter is uh, transmitted uh, uh, signal and electric power to the receiver to control the, the, uh, the uh, diaphragm uh, activation. Here we started with the dog experiment and here is shown the uh, installation of the electrodes. This was made quite a long time ago. The first devices you see that it is uh, built from discrete components not with, with um, integrated circuits. Nowadays they are made of course with integrated circuits and placed under the skin here to the patient. Electrodes are placed here, and this is a receiver. And the transmitting coil is here to test that it works. 
And this is the uh, prototype of the transmitter. And it was possible, or is possible, to, to get the patient breathing qu quite normally because uh, the other possibility, which is traditionally used, is to use a respirator, which for the long time is very, very, very uh, inconvenient for the patient. It is the Atratec company which was a consequence of this, this, uh, this research, which is producing worldwide selling uh, sti stimulators. That is taken just a photo from some IEEE journal, I think. A lady who has paralyzed legs is able to bike when, when it is stimulated electrically, the muscles of the legs. And here is another lady with paralyzed legs, but she is able to stand when having a stimulator stimulating the muscles on the legs. Uh, this is a bit strange. Strange, it is a treating obesity with a stimulator. It is a large number of, of uh, such stimulators are installed. Uh, 140,000 operations annually in USA. And, and that's, that's a big number. So it is like a pacemaker placed under the skin and it's stimulating electrode goes to the stomach, to the ventricle. And it is quite not known what is the mechanism, uh, the neural stimulation or hormonal secretion or muscular stimulus in the ventricle, which m makes the patient to, to eat less and, and, and treat the overweight uh, obesity. This is uh, a very wide application, but the patients, uh, of course, don't, are not uh, willing to speak it about too, too, too much. It is a managing of urinary and bowel incontinence. Well, uh, especially elderly ladies have problems to, to keep the urine, and that is, of course, uh, uh, very, very uh, inconvenient social problem. It is, of course, not dangerous to the health, but inconvenient social problem. So this kind of small stimulation is installed under the skin and, and the neurostimulation, which is stimulates to the, to the muscles on the pelvis and, and keeps the urine inside, which is, this is, uh, uh, the urinary incontinence is a problem in women. I have the data that every fifth woman in the age class 25 to 60 years has these kind of problems. And over 70 year old ladies, two thirds. So that is, that is a very, very high number, very high number. How many of those get this uh, uh, stimulator? That's another issue, but, but the problem, problem is uh, very, very common. So it's nice, fine, and so small stimulator helps with this problem and that's it. The battery works about seven to ten years, and that's, that's nice. This is another application, the Parkinson disease uh, patients. Uh, they have a muscular tremor, so the, the, the hands and, and the body is, is tremoring, which is, uh, of course, socially unpleasant and inconvenient, but it also makes it uh, difficult to, to, to do everyday uh, uh, task with hands, ev even to eat and use the fork and knife because the hands are tremoring. So it is possible to install a stimulator whose electrodes are placed to the brain, to the certain re region deep in the brain. And, and these are quite common. I have some data that 30,000 are implanted in 2004. Here's an, another illustration. So that, that is quite common application of functional electrical stimulation. Do you know what is this? This, this is a kind of weapon. Not so very kind and pleasant issue, but I speak a little bit about this taser. It is, it is a device where, uh, like a handgun, but it, 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 doesn't, it has a, a power nitrogen, and when it is uh, uh, switched, the darts are uh, shot uh, several meters length, and they have electric leads, uh, and, and when these darts touch the skin of the object, there is a 
uh, impulse generator in, in, in the device which generates electric current and that current paralyzes for a while, for a certain time, the, the object. So this is another instrument. So, so distance is about seven meters for it, which it can be used. So there are several, these large number of these, uh, these uh, guns which have been sold. Uh, 100,000 devices in 10 years. But that is not fully safe. I have some data that uh, in 2004 I, I, I read that 70 persons had died due to the application of this taser device. And, and uh, that is very unfortunate. But uh, it is used against very aggressive persons and criminals by the police forces and uh, the other alternative would be to use a fire gun, and that is, of course, much, much more dangerous. So this is dangerous, but not so dangerous and lethal as a fire gun. Uh, but uh, here are some figures of how many uh, deaths have been in the United States with the taser. So, so please remember that it, it is not fully safe. That's another device. There's a laser pointer which helps in, in, in pointing the correct direction. It touches the skin. And uh, uh, this dodge and, and electric current is flowing here. There is a risk that some, some stimulation of the heart may take place. Here is a uh, curve about the, 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 the stimulus current, which is, which is uh, uh, delivered along the uh, leads. And this shows how... Uh, uh, in general, how lethal or, 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 or strong it is, this is a taser shock. Here is the consequences of, of, of electric stimulation of current versus frequency. And, and some tingling sensation is caused with this kind of stimulus. Pain limit is here. Lock up muscles here, interferes with breathing, causes heart to behave erratically and leads to internal burns. So taser shock, they claim that it is on the very safe level. Uh, this picture is just taken in the Finland, Finnish police forces. The Finnish police had in 2006 150 devices. I don't know how many you have in, in Germany, but certainly much more uh, per, per population than we have in Finland, I think so. But what they did, the, the policemen just wanted to get experience so that uh, they, they experimented to themselves. So these three gentlemen are policemen. So that he's not any criminal, he's a one policeman to, to whom this is uh, uh, experimented. And here is the same. These are all policemen experimented uh, testing the taser. It is not pleasant, but it's, I think it's good for the policemen to know how it feels. Here's annual application of the taser in Finland, the number of applications. What is positive here is that here are the, you see that, for instance, 2011, 355 altogether. So shooting the darts, so many, touching, just touching with the taser and asking the, uh, uh, the, the is enough. And warning on three, just uh, when the policeman just takes the taser, then the, then the criminal thinks that it's better just to be calm because otherwise he will be shot. So I think this is the best region when, when, when knowing that it is uh, unpleasant, the criminal just stops uh, his aggression. That's safe, safe, very safe region. I have here some uh, real uh, stories, but I, I, you can find them from the uh, Google if you want. I don't want to that you lose your uh, uh, sleep next night. Here are several. Uh, what is surprising in the taser is that they are not sold only for policemen and so officials. They are sold for everyone, especially in the United States, where everyone can buy a, a, a firearm. So here is a ladies' model, just a pink taser. I have one minute, and that's enough. This is not uh, functional electrical stimulation, but I just show a few slides. Myoelectrically controlled arm prosthesis. This is an old picture, but the modern ones are mechanically quite similar, but the electronics is more sophisticated. So when someone has lost the arm, it is possible to install this kind of prosthesis 
and it is controlled by my, my uh, electric activity. So it is a lot of electrodes placed to the, to the body of the patient. And when the patient is moving those uh, muscles uh, activating in the body, it controls the, the prosthetic arm. This is another application, testing the ergonomics of the garden tools by recording the electromyocardia. Necessarily don't belong to this chapter. Bionic body, a powered robotic suit designed to help elderly and disabled people walk and carry things. This was made in Japan, this kind of extra celeton. Uh, the, the gentleman comes much more strong when having this extra celeton powered with, with electricity. And this is uh, just extra celeton for a par paralyzed uh, friendly kind lady who is able to walk with this kind of extra celeton. This is, this is a nice application. So it is quarter to 12 and I continue on magnetic stimulation. Next time I just wonder if whether I can uh, next time speak about impedance cardiography and impedance tomography. Perhaps at the end of the next week lecture, at least on the beginning of the, of the, of the final lecture, because uh, bioimpedance is a very uh, big activity, bioimpedance research in this Helmholtz Institute. But I think I stop here and we continue after one week. Thank you very much.